Hey farmers and landowners, this is Damian Mason coming at you with a question. Have you ever had disease or pest problems cost you money by reducing your yield? Well, of course you have. We fight this, right? That's what production agriculture is all about, is working as best we can to put out a great yield, and to do so, oftentimes, you've got to overcome disease and pests. The problem is we usually treat those diseases and pests after the problem, right? So what if you could do it proactively? What if you had a tool that gave you predictive analytics? so that you would know if you have things like corn rootworm, uh, soybean cyst nematode, sudden death syndrome. Well, you have that tool now. It's from Pattern Ag. Pattern Ag doing predictive soil analytics way beyond just the old days of sticking a probe in the ground every few acres and saying, hey, wow, we got some nitrogen deficiency here. They'll let you know if you have pests and disease. Go to pattern.ag. That's www.pattern.ag to learn more about this awesome technology and how it can help you increase your yields by taking care of diseases and pests before they cause you harm. Well, greetings and welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture podcast with me, your host, Damian Mason. I've got a great topic for you today. We're talking about what an aging and shrinking population means for agriculture and everyone else. We've covered this topic before from the angle of population decline, but you've never heard us talk about aging population. Aging population is going to have huge ramifications on all global economies, all consumption patterns, and particularly in what we do in agriculture. My co-host, favorite co-host of all time, Todd Thurman, and I are going to do great service on this because we've talked about it before. Todd is a business consultant to agriculture, and he also helps me with the Business of Ag Success Group, where ag professionals get together and network, and we're bringing guest presenters every two weeks on an online meeting format. Todd and I have discussed this before. He is almost a China expert. So if you have a, an event, you want somebody to come in and talk about China and the impact on agriculture and your industry as it pertains to China, you should give him a shout and have him come and talk to your group because he's got a lot of stuff on this. And that's why he's on here now. What an aging and shrinking population means for ag and everyone else. Todd, what is an aging and shrinking? Po- First off, there's those that are going to say, wait a minute, I haven't heard this before shrinking. We're going to have 9.6 billion people. They just told me that. And everybody in ag says, feed the world, feed the world. We have 10 billion people in the next 30 years. We have to make more food in the next 30 years than we've ever made in the history of mankind. You and I both know that that is bullshit. The population will not get to 10 billion. It will not get to 9.6 billion. It won't even get to 9 billion. We covered that about six or eight months ago. We also covered it two years ago with Daryl Bricker, the author of Empty Planet. Tell them real quickly why we are not going to have an overpopulation problem, and then we'll get into the aging thing. Well, the global fertility rate has been declining precipitously. Um, And so what we're seeing is in virtually every country in the world, if you live anywhere in the world outside of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you are either already in a declining population or you will soon be in a declining population. Um, and so that's really that's really what this is all about, um, you know, aside from those African countries um, that By are the way, projected the, the, to continue to grow. But the person's going to say, yeah, but those African countries, that's where the 10 billion is going to come from. No, because there's only about a dozen countries that have a fertility rate that is uh, above 2.1, which is what it takes to be uh, to be gaining population. And of those dozen countries, their population is like a couple hundred million. It's just not enough numbers. It's like saying, you know, it's too big. Of, it's too big of a world for that small of a populace to make a significant difference to make up for the. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to, we're definitely going to see some, some growth in, in Africa, but I think there's plenty of reason to believe that even some of that is overstated uh, because I think uh, there's a, there's a, a likelihood that the fertility rate is going to decline at a faster rate in Africa than what most of the projections are. Um, so, so we're going to continue to see, you know, Africa be the only country that's, you know, a growing population. Um, but that's a, a lot of eggs. Africa, the only continent, the only continent. Yes, that's right. Sorry. 
Okay, so dig this real quickly, uh, dear listener. If you're listening to this and you haven't heard Todd and I's assessment of this before, it's real simple and we can get into it, but we don't have to. Just go back and listen to the episode when we talked about what a declining population and feed the world and all that. I've covered this three to four different times, but it's important because it's the biggest impact that's coming to agriculture that nobody's talking about. You go to meetings in agriculture, they still have the same old, tired, not even factually accurate stuff. 10 billion people by 2050, we're going to have to make more food than we've ever made. It's just not true. Every country of 195 countries on the planet, I think is what it is, 180 some of them are in a population decline, not yet, but they will be soon because of the fertility rate. Fertility rates are declining rapidly because the more economically advanced a woman becomes, And the more educated the girl becomes, the later in life she has kids, the less kids she has. That's happening. So you're saying, all right, that's that's something I disagree with because I've not heard that. Of course you have, because nobody tells you that, because it goes against everything you've heard in your whole life, because agriculture's feed the world, feed the world. Now, let's talk about what this really means. When a when a decline, when you start having declines in fertility, you have less babies. That's where it brings up the aging thing. Todd, this is a biggie. Even if they disagree with us about the prediction that we're not going to have 10 billion people, they can't deny the fact that, for instance, here in the United States of America, the median age is 11 years older today than it was when I was born in 1969. I want you to think about that. In 53 years, the median age, half above, half below, half above, that's where the median is. We've gotten 11 years older as a, as a population in the United States in the last half century. That's a true story. If you don't believe me, look it up. We're getting older. So is the whole world. Take me there. Right. So so not only do we have a declining fertility rate, so we're having fewer babies, um, we are living longer, right? Virtually everywhere in the world is expanding their life expectancies, especially in the developing world. And that's all great news for everybody, obviously. Um, so as we have fewer babies, uh, some of that population uh, decline is mitigated by the fact that people are living longer, but that has significant ramifications for agriculture and for the broader economy and society and political systems. Um, And that's kind of what we're going to focus on here today is more of the aging aspect of it. Um, So we're looking at at, at China, um, reasonable, very reasonable estimates have uh, by 2030. So we're talking about less than eight years from now, uh, by 2030, the working, uh, the retired population in China will be bigger than the working population. (laughs) So you literally have more retired people that are drawing from uh, the resources than you have people that are contributing to the resources. And that's not 2050 or 2100. That's in, in, in a few seven or eight years in the currently biggest uh, country in the world population. Yeah. Second largest economy, China, biggest population country. Now, there is some stuff I just read that says India might replace China on population, but either way, they're roughly on par. They're both roughly about 1.3 to 1.4 billion people. Obviously, China has a larger economy because they've really become the world's factory floor. So what does it mean about the aging? So again, we we push through as quickly as possible the shrinking population because we've covered that before. What does an aging population mean for ag and everyone else? Well, the first one that Todd and I talk a great deal about is the consumer. And he can give us some of that using China as an example. But then we're going to talk about the workforce. Because remember, the younger you are, the more you tend to eat, the more you also have to work. The older you are, you stop eating as much because you're getting closer to dying and you probably become retired. So a bunch of stuff here. Let's start with the consumption part, aging population. Talk about consumption, Todd. Yeah. So and we use China as an example a lot because, you know, as we have some of these discussions, um, it gets very complicated when you start talking about it on a global scale. But, but clearly, uh, China is an important uh, country just in terms of, you know, 20 percent of the current global population lives in China right now. So obviously it's it's meaningful from that standpoint. It's the second biggest economy, as you mentioned. Um, and then from an ag perspective, from a U.S. ag perspective, um, it's the number one destination for ag exports. And, we, you know, we were talking earlier, I looked up the, the top 10 ag exports uh, from the U.S. and uh, China is the number one, two or three destination of all 10. Right. And that's in 2021. Now, there's 
you know, some strange years the last few years. But in 2021, uh, China was one, two, or three on the top uh, uh, for every of the top ten. Uh, the top five alone were all China number one destination. So um, just just because remember this the business of ag podcast everybody here got a vested interest in this they probably hear about China a lot every meeting they go to they get told that we're going to overpopulate ten billion people feed the world but they also hear about China 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 was not a significant agricultural destination export destination for us as recently as twenty years ago certainly you go back thirty and forty years ago they weren't a destination at all they became this absolute monolith uh, you know the if you know your history Richard Nixon was the one that sort of opened up diplomacy that was when well nixon left resigned from office in 74 so you're talking about early 70s late 60s early 70s china and us started even playing ping pong and ping pong diplomacy and then all of a sudden they became a customer they become a juggernaut frankly about less than within the last 20 years the united states if you'd have told anyone here when we were playing ping pong with them in the 70s china is going to become the top destination for five of our uh our biggest five ag exports and then second or third of the next five biggest ag exports. They said, no, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Go ahead and just share what, what those look like because it's important. It's it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're the number one, and this is by value. Uh, They're the number one importer of U S soybeans, corn, uh, forest products, which excludes paper. So we're basically talking about lumber. They're essentially tied with Canada uh, for forest products, uh, coarse grains. That's, uh, uh, excluding corn, uh, pork, beef, uh, cotton, tree nuts, poultry, and fish and seafood. So those are the top 10. Uh, they're the top in order. Uh, they're the number one uh, destination for the top five. Uh, they're also the number one destination of U.S. cotton. Uh, they're two in tree nuts and poultry and three in beef and fish and seafood. Um, so it's a it's a significant uh, uh, uh piece of total uh, U.S. ag exports. And, and it's hard to imagine uh, a scenario where uh, changes, dramatic changes in China don't have a dramatic impact on, on U.S. agriculture. And so that's why, you know, this is sort of a global issue. But China is a great example because they're, they're such a big piece of this. They're not only a great example because they're such a big economy, such a big population. They're also experiencing one of the most challenging demographic crises. So that population decline that we talked about is going to be quite significant. Even if you use the very uh, conservative uh, UN numbers, uh, they're projecting a significant reduction in the Chinese population over the next 80 years. Some people are predicting a, a much more aggressive uh, decline there, and we can, we can get into those details. But really here, we're focused on more on the aging, and China is also the best example. They are the fastest aging society in human history. There is no doubt about that. Really, no one disagrees, uh, right. you know, from a demographic standpoint. They're the fastest aging, meaning as a country, they're getting older as a society because, uh, well, I guess go back to the whole thing. They thought 42 years ago they were going to have an overpopulation problem. They instituted the one-child policy in 1980. 1980. They, they basically, by government decree and through force, through force, said you can only have one baby unless you're one of the ruling Communist Party members. So six years ago, they said this is going to be an issue. They said, hey, you can have two babies now. Well, after 40 years of being persecuted, prosecuted, having forced sterilizations and forced abortions, the Chinese women said, I'm not going to have two kids. We, so we, so they didn't. And also, now they said two years ago, you can have three babies. It's not happening. So they're rapidly aging. And then you're saying, but why are we talking about China? What about the whole world? Aren't there a bunch of babies there? No, the reality is it's not happening. This aging phenomenon is happening throughout the world. And so we're going to get into what it means about labor and what it means about economics. But let's go back to consumption. We've relied on, in agriculture, uh, uh, population growth and more miles to feed forever, especially the North American ag model has always been make as much stuff as you can, put it on a container ship to somewhere or sell it locally if you can. Old people eat less Old people eat differently. Ideally, old people have better economics than, say, they did when they were 23 years old raising a family. So they might eat a little bit better, higher quality stuff, but they don't eat as much. They eat out more. They eat smaller packages. They're, there's a bunch of stuff here that's going to happen on the consumption front. What do you see? Yeah, so I think from a consumption standpoint, the, the biggest issue is they eat less food. 
Um, and this is a phenomenon that I did, the medical community doesn't completely understand, but uh, presumably your base. Uh, you uh, said the medical community does completely down. does or does not understand. Does not completely understand. I, I agree with you. Uh, the reasons you. behind it. Um, but, you know, uh, clearly it's a phenomenon. It's nobody disagrees that that older people consume less food. The reason why is a little bit debatable. Uh, presumably it has something to do with lower base metabolic rates. Um, uh, but regardless of or the reasons why, it, it certainly does happen. Um, and we have no reason to believe that that pattern won't continue. So they eat less food overall. They also tend to eat less sugary foods, sweet foods. They tend to eat less fast food um, when they do eat out. And, and especially uh, the younger half of the elderly population does tend to, tend to eat out quite a bit, but they don't often eat out at fast food. So that distribution of, you know, more sit down restaurants compared to fast food um, is different than than the general population. Uh, they tend to eat more fruits and vegetables and grains and less meat. So that's essentially the as the population ages, uh, that's essentially the pattern that we can expect to see. Um, some of that is driven not just by age itself, but by the fact that. Uh, women tend to live longer than men. And so those older populations tend to be more female as well. And so that's just uh, um, uh, another factor that contributes to that. So a lot of those trends that you see are also driven by the fact that as we become an older population, we're going to become more female. Now, China maybe is not the best example of that right. because we have a they killed off, distribution. They, they, killed off the, they killed off infant baby girls, which is tragic, uh, but it's true. I'm not laughing about that. I'm, I'm laughing yep. because there's no question that four years later that's what's happened uh faced with the idea that you were only allowed to have one child many couples committed infanticide is how disgusting that whole uh decree was about one child so of course 40 years later there are less adult female chinese uh, residents one right. thing is a really neat example my dairy farm background and i i love the dairy people but they just struggle because dairy people love to make milk they just love to make milk it's what they want to do farmers love to farm farmers love to plant corn and god knows dairy farmers love to make milk they can't understand why we're at 16 gallons of fluid milk consumption per America per year. When, good God, in the old days, yeah, at the end of World War II, it was 47, 48 gallons. What happened at the end of World War II? It's called a baby boom. <laughs> Who consumes milk? Children. <laughs> when you're talking about old people, we'll pull your stats there, Todd. Do old people drink a gallon of milk every three days? Do they eat a lot of cereal? Yeah. So so we're going to see consumption pattern changes here at home, but even globally on the product mix. Right. Yeah. And and it's remarkable to me that uh, that we don't really hear anybody talking about this on, on any scale. And and, you know, we all of our systems are really built on this assumption that we're going to have, number one, a growing population yeah. and that that our distribution of ages is is not going to be significantly different and so um neither of those things are the case and so we have an opportunity here to prepare this is not like this is happening tomorrow but it is happening relatively soon and if you're talking about reworking entire systems political systems economic systems yeah. um that can't happen overnight um and so we really need to be having this conversation i mean i'm certainly glad to hear elon musk uh, try to get the the conversation started on population uh, decline. He's one of the you know. There's been some of us out there, you know, with our bull horns. But I, I would have been out there. That he's he's going a little bit more the way the media works. He started being more uh, doom and gloom. He started calling it population collapse. You and I have just said it's a population decline. I said it for you know ten years, and then uh, finally we discovered he's talking like us. Hey, real quickly, I want to remind our listeners. If you are in the business of agriculture and you're not checking out this new app, I would encourage you to do so. It's called AgVisor Pro. AgVisor Pro. AgVisor Pro. It's an app. Just go on your phone. You've got a phone. You've got a smartphone. Go to your app store. Look up AgVisor Pro. One of the things that uh, the founder, Rob Syke, a friend of mine, set out to do was to create an information exchange. You're probably not aware of this, but for instance, farmers, uh, by their calculus, spend 19% of their time seeking information. So you need information that's readily available. You can go on Ag Twitter and, and get ridiculed for asking a question that you should know the answer to, or you can find an expert. You can also be an expert. If you want to be an expert on AgVisor Pro, upload your profile, put your expertise, and people can seek you out. You can get paid to be an expert. 
point is it's information at your fingertips and it's from expert sources. And if you don't like what you find out, then go to a different expert. Anyway, go to AgVisor Pro, put the app on your phone and you know what? You'll probably be more informed for doing so. All right. About this situation, Todd, um, I see huge consumption patterns changing and we uh, as a industry like to just make more stuff. You have obviously intimate ties and expertise in pork. And you said every year the United States produces 2% more pork than we did the year prior. Probably not an exact, it's probably not an exact trajectory, but within reason it's 2% more, right? We've always relied on find us another place to take that pork. And that's going to continue for a while because if economies continue to improve, people eat more pork, they eat more meat, they eat better. We hit a point where eventually 2%, 2%, it's kind of like compound interest. 2% doesn't seem like much, but it's 2%, 2%. It just keeps adding up. And then the eaters say, yeah, I used to eat two pork chops. I used to also go out and do manual labor all day. Where does this end on this whole thing about we keep making more as an aging population eventually, maybe not tomorrow, but 5, 10, 15 years from now, eats less? Well, as we, as we think about the future and we try to look 10, 20, 30 years into the future, I think it's really helpful to go back and look at what was different 10, 20, 30 years ago. You mentioned uh, earlier that nobody 20 years ago would have imagined that the number one ag importer in the world, you know, to the tune of $170 billion would be China. You, know, you wouldn't have been able to find anybody that would. That was 20 years ago. That wasn't 100 years ago. That was right, 20 right, years right. ago. Um, you know, 30 years ago, the U.S. was a net importer of pork, right? Today, we export 30% of everything we uh, produce. Um, so, I mean, if you think about the amount of changes, that, I mean, that, that's such a fundamentally different industry just in 30 years. You know, I've been around for most of that 30 years. And so, you know, it becomes a lot easier to imagine what these changes could look like. And, and some of these claims don't seem don't seem so crazy when you think about it in that way. What, we've, what we're about to experience, though, is sometime, you know, in the even – you know, regardless of, of whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about population decline, uh, we're going to see some significant changes in those uh, consumption patterns. We're going to see some significant changes in population. And this is unprecedented in human history. Okay, we've had situations where we had, you know, pandemics and wars where we had population declines in, in countries and even very broadly, obviously, the plague in, in Europe. Um but those world, were world, all based world war, on World War Two. World War Two for about five years. You'd have a, because we had such disruption. You know the the men were not there and they were getting shots. So you lose population that way, and then you've got people that are supplanted. And all of a sudden, you have people dying of malaria because they're living, you know, in squalor. That that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about demographic vast demographic trends that don't have their basis in a war or a vi- or a plague yeah they're they're fundamental trends they're not they're fundamental underlying trends they're not anomalies they're not short term um, events um, right. as as disruptive as those can be and certainly the russians can attest to the fact that 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 a war can have long lasting impacts on on demographics but um, we're talking about fundamental fundamental underlying changes that it's just hard to imagine how any of those are going to going to you know change significantly we look at the drivers behind the the fertility decline and i had a discussion with a a client about china the other day those drivers are urbanization secularization okay Uh, and uh increasing incomes those those are the main drivers uh and then education you know particularly among women those are the four main drivers we just just talked about this driving it why we'll continue to have less babies and be more of an aging population globally secularization so less religiosity yeah 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 uh, right. education the more educated you become uh it's a data it's a proven point uh the less babies you have the older you wait and then obviously economic development and then mm-hmm. you threw out another one what was the other one urbanization. urbanization so as you move into cities you know you know children become less of a asset and more of a liability and you have smaller spaces and and kids, you know, seven kids is not that cute when you live in a 600 square foot apartment compared to a, you know, rural farm. So, um, you know, so unless you think some of those, one of the, one or more of those trends is going to dramatically reverse itself. And I can't imagine 
that any of those is the case, um, then we're going to see this not only continue, but we're going to see it continue to decline. Um, and so, you know, those, we're talking about uh, uh, major changes that are going to happen over the next 20 or 30 years. It, things that happen, and, 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 and I know we've way overused the term unprecedented, but it certainly applies in this case because I don't think there is an example of, of a corollary in human history. Everything, everything we've ever done, uh, all of our economic systems, all of our uh, political systems, all of our societal systems are really kind of underlying, you know, whether you realize it or not, are based on this assumption that there's going to be more and more people every year. Um, certainly, you know, pork is a great example. We're going to get, we can continue. Uh, we, we outstripped our, our ability to consume it here in the U S. And so we've been able to export that and the industry's done a great job. Um, but eventually we're going to have to figure out how to manage a decline. And that's something that we don't really have any experience. With. We don't have any experience doing it. And I hate to use this example, but I, I love the fact that you just pointed out that nobody 20 to 25 years ago would have even thought of China as this m massive monolithic thing of consumption that they are for our everything we can produce. And nobody would have predicted. I mean, and so when you start saying that's only 20 years, you know, we're not talking about 200. We're not talking about some sci fi thing. We're talking about a couple of decades or in some cases, way sooner than that, five to 10. I hate to do this, but if agriculture says, Damien, you're worried about stuff, shouldn't be worried about Todd. I, I mean, I don't disagree with some of your stuff, but that's 100 years down the road. No, it's not. Now, let me just give this as an example. There's been there's one thing that everybody knows about that's in the United States of America. Every single person knows about this. It's called Social Security. The, the system was invented in the 1930s by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration. And the entire premise, well, first off, it was to keep him elected. And, uh, and it was a very socialistic program when you think about it of, at its time. But also it was predicated on population. There's going to be more people tomorrow and there's going to be more young people tomorrow. So therefore we can take their money to pay you. Cause remember the original social security recipients had never paid $1 into it. He just started giving it to them with the idea that we're going to pay you on the come and the come is tomorrow's babies. And there's going to be more population. There's going to be more young people. How is social security working today? Of course, the answer is it's a bankrupt, screwed up mess. It's an, it's never going to, it's, it's dysfunctional. You're saying that's government. They, they've, it doesn't matter. Let's use that as the worst case scenario for what if all of agriculture is predicated on the same premise as Social Security was? And I would say it largely is. Yes. Well, and it's not just the U.S. system. I mean, every system in the world of social in welfare. some way, shape or form relies on a working a group, population of working people to help support uh, aging an aging population, right? Um, you know, the China's pension system, very much the same way. Obviously, two very different economic systems, yeah. but everybody's system in one way, shape, or form um, is, 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 is based on that concept of working people helping support uh, these older retired people. So, and now we're talking about not just, not just older retired people, but even older people, right? So you know the the the, the eighty and ninety year olds were, were were really uncommon, right? And so this this whole uh, this whole concept of of the elderly when we started when we started Social Security and you were supposed to start collecting Social Security at sixty two, the government pretty much anticipated you'd be dying in the next two or three years. And so instead of drawing Social Security for two or three or four or five years, people are expecting to draw Social Security for ten or twenty or thirty years, and that's not going to happen. So dig this. Um, one of the things that you and I chat about then is, uh, and I posted this on social media, who will do the work? So we keep talking about what's this going to mean for ag? First off, the consumption patterns are going to change. The amount of consumption is going to change. The fact that the United States and almost all of the, uh, I mean, North, North America, Canada, the same way, make much of the stuff, find a customer for it. Eventually, and maybe not tomorrow, we have some food blips in the meantime. We got energy concerns. We don't have fertilizer because there's no natural gas. We're not talking about this winter. We're not talking about this coming spring. We're talking about five and 10 years from now, which is still enough that we should sure as hell be thinking about it. Consumption and then the production, assuming that ag does what it always does and just starts making more stuff, 2% more pork each year, 1.9 bushels of corn per acre each year, more than we did the year prior, about eight, eight to, to eight tenths to one more bushel of soybeans each year, more than we did the year prior. These are all fundamental. These are all awesome things for the environment, all that productivity, natural resource consumption. But eventually you say, all right, we don't have that problem of just need we don't we, we don't have the problem of so many more people and we got older people 
Then the question arises, who does the work? And you and I have delved into this quite a bit. In the short term, you give me your assessment, what happens on who does the work? Because a 47-year-old does not work as um, vigorously in production agriculture, doing the hands-on stuff as a 27-year-old. And then we can go on and on and on about who does the work. Who does the work for us, but who does the work in the entire economy? Yeah, so I think it, it, you have to look at it a little bit differently. I think there's two fundamentally different uh, situations around the world. One is uh, economies that are in cultures that are open to immigration and the other group that are really not. Um, now, that could change even in those uh, economies. But for a lot of countries, the U.S., Canada, Europe, immigration is going to be a significant part of the solution and it's going to dull the effects of some of the things that we're talking about because we're going to be able to attract immigrants to come in and and replace some of those working age people uh, but there's big economies out there uh, china and russia would be the most obvious examples um, but even india that are not very culturally politically or really in any other way open to immigration um, and so for these you know, countries that are open to immigration, that's going to be a big part of that. So I think that's something we ought to think about. As much as I hate to give them credit for it, the, the Canadians are really leading the way here and trying to figure out how to do immigration. Why? Now they have some advantages um, in that they don't have a southern border like we have. Um, so um, there's some issues there, but that's definitely something we need to be now, thinking wait, about. The Canadians the other- do have a southern border, Todd. It is, it's us. And so when the Canadians tell us we're mean about our southern border, I say, well, look at your southern border. I can barely get into the damn country of Canada, and and I'm as legal as it gets with all the passports, and I'm just trying to come to a damn wheat conference. So, yeah, screw the Canadians. Anyway, I'm kidding. I like the Canadians. (laughs) Um, Let me ask you this. One biggie, though, um, when we really look at this, eventually you run out of immigrants. If these other countries are also getting older uh, and less populous, they also are saying, hey, it was a big thing to go to the United States and pick cauliflower. Uh, but 10 years from now, they're saying things aren't bad here. And also, I'm too old to go and pick cauliflower. <laughs> what happens then? Well, there's some really, there's some really old uh, notions um, that people have about the way things work. You know, one of those that I talk about all the time is there's still a lot of people that think China is a low cost uh, low labor costs country. And it's, that's simply not true. Another thing that people don't realize is that immigration from Mexico has been going down for 20 years, right? The people that are crossing that border, they're crossing the Mexican border, but they're not from Mexico. They're from Central America and South America and sometimes the Caribbean. And by the um, way, and so, the, the folks that don't understand that, yeah, they might be coming across the Mexican border. And why are the two reasons uh, you know, go and ask somebody that hires uh, labor to put, you know, milkers on cows, and they'll tell you they haven't hired a person, for, a Mexican national, probably for the last five to 10 years, because in Mexico, population is doing what we're talking about, getting older and and declining or not declining, but the fertility rate is below 2.1. They're less they're less motivated to come here and do that. Again, it's, it's Central America. It's Guatemala that's uh, that we're talking about. Right. Yeah, and the ones we have are, are really only uh, those that come over on the T and Visa uh, program, and that's because it's specifically for Mexicans. And so, you know, one of the one of the things we can do from an immigration standpoint, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but is, yeah. is open up that process to you know uh, broader populations. Uh, the other main factor that that we need to discuss is is automation. Uh, direct automation, um, where machines, robots are going to replace workers. Um, but I think where it might even be a bigger issue is, yeah, it might even be a bigger issue is where we have the opportunity to uh, supplement human labor. And that can be an issue where you've got, yeah, there's a physical demanding part. Um, if you can remove some of that physically demanding part, then all of a sudden older workers can uh, be effective in a broader range of roles. So, you know, a uh, older worker not might not be able to carry 50 pound uh, bags of feed, but they can operate a, a forklift that can carry around 50 pound bags of feed. And so about, um, about, that's that's definitely something that we're going we're gonna to have to look at. Well, speaking of technology, it was about five years ago, we saw the first thing it was called an exoskeleton robot, if I'm not mistaken, where let's say somebody like me that I, I still can do stuff, but I'm like, hey, five years from now, I'm not sure, man, I'm kind of banged up. I'm getting, I'm getting pushing, you know, you wear this thing and it 
it then takes the stress off of your joints and your knees and your hips. And you can still go out and carry a hundred pounds around like you did when you were a young guy. That's kind of a neat idea. I held this up. If you're a listener, cause most of you listen, but some of you watch these videos. And if you are a listener and you want to watch the video, go to the Damian Mason channel on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, type in Damian Mason channel, hit subscribe. It'll cost you nothing. I'd love for you to be a subscriber to my YouTube channel. I held up this headline, which is how Todd and I started this discussion before uh, we ever started recording this. China ramps up robotics as plant workforce shrinks. And this is from about a week or so ago in the Wall Street. And I just want to read the very first paragraph says that China's in, China installed almost as many robots in its factories last year as the rest of the world combined. China put in as many robots in industrial facilities last year as the rest of the world combined. I want you to think about that. And why did they do that? They want to automate and consolidate its manufacturing dominance as its working age population shrinks. That's exactly what we're talking about. So can we robot, can we automate enough to make up for what we have going on with the working age population uh, getting older? And that's really what we're talking about, right, Tom? Yeah, and it, and it could be a big part of the solution. And, and I'm a very big proponent of the concept that it's not necessarily machines replacing man, but man plus machines. You know, that's the way we need to be thinking about this moving forward, you know, as opposed to this, oh, no, we're the, the you know, the robots, the machines are going to take our jobs or whatever. Um, uh, that's really not an issue for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but really what it is about is about supplementing uh, human potential and allowing the humans to do what they do well and allowing the machines to do what they do well, which is, you know, uh, manual labor, um, you know, high volume uh, type work, uh, repetitive work, those types of things. Very so we need to be thinking about that. They're very good at the repetitive stuff. But I want to point this out. This is a biggie, you know, that about who's going to do the work. These robots, when I worked in a ceiling tile factory when I was, you know, 19 years old, uh, the unskilled, uneducated guys were terrified of automation because it meant that they had no job. But the reality is there's still, we are in right now pretty recessionary times based on all of the things that we are seeing. And yet, I just heard this morning, Amazon is going to hire 150,000 employees, they hope to, between now and the holidays for all their rush of holiday orders. And they're going to pay them $19 an hour, and they're going to give a $3,000 signing bonus. Maybe you heard that as well. Walmart and Target are right there with a couple other big retailers, and they're talking 40,000, one retailer, 50. That's numbers of employees they want to hire in a labor force that remains really tight. And so what you got to wonder is, boy, inflation, uh, gas prices are so hard, you'd think they wouldn't have a problem finding people to work. It looks like we're in this situation and you can say, well, is it because of the welfare system? Maybe, but also there are the demographics that we keep talking about. We've seen these signs, you and I see them and talk about them and somehow they seem lost on other people. Amazon is going to pay $19 and a $3,000 bonus for people to go and pick shelves, uh, pick stuff off of shelves. That's that's huge considering that last year the going price was 15. You know, I mean, that's that can, that's inflationary, but it's also a tight labor market. And so this thing is is very indicative to me that it's more than just uh, it's more than just coming out of the whole covid reset. We still are talking about people that aren't going to go back to work because it's an aging population. And they just feel like they're done working. Well, then, then, you know, we're seeing this already. I mean, look at the, the pilot situation where they, during COVID, they encouraged a bunch of people to take early retirement. And they, a bunch of them took them up on it. And now they're saying, hey, please come back. And they're saying, no, thanks. This is, this is working out pretty well for me. So I, what you're seeing here, and like we've talked about this before, COVID accelerated existing trends. And uh, what you're seeing here is a preview of what's to come. This labor tightness is, is not temporary. It may ease itself a little bit uh, for a while, but this is the preview. And, you know, we really need to be paying attention and and thinking through the implications of this and, and understanding that these are long term trends. These are issues that we're going to have to deal with. And, and automation is part of the solution. Uh, immigration in these countries that are open to it are part of the solution. But none of those have a complete answer for our systems that are built around, um, you know, some of these problems. I mean, we talked about with uh, automation. I always always say the two problems with with robots is they don't eat. And they don't pay taxes. And so if you have a system that's designed around workers consuming, you know, eating and paying taxes, uh, then that automation may may relieve your labor 
challenges, but it, it, it creates some other problems that are very fundamental and that, frankly, we don't have very good answers for. We don't have an answer for it at all. So let's just think about that. In general, automation didn't mean that there was no jobs. That's what kind of we're talking about. I just said there was more than 200, I think two to 300,000 jobs were announced today on the business news that I was checking out uh, this morning. And you're saying, okay, even with automation, trust me, the Amazon picking facilities are automated, but they still need employees, right? So you're saying, okay, we're, we're then talking about automation will replace some of the human hands, but we also, some of the human hands are replacing, we're going to age out anyhow. Just like those pilots. Hey, I was going to fly for another three years, but I'm 57. I'm done. Whatever. They split. Well, then you're like, okay, well, that consumer still exists, but we know there's going to be less babies getting had. So then we got the population decline and we got the machines. Ag still thinks that if we can just make I just worked for a beef group last month, Todd, and I was talking about the demographics on beef and how we're going to probably lose some consumption through these high prices. And like everybody in ag, guess what he told me? He says, well, now the best thing we can do, we just need to be making more beef. I said, I just explained to you that we're going to have price pressure on this and protein consumption went down the last recession because of, uh, you know, squeeze on the home uh, checkbooks. He says, yeah, that's why we need to make more of it. And so the answer for most people in ag is they think if I can just make more of it. And I'm like, that that does not answer the demographic problems that are in front of us. Do you agree that, that, that they seem to just think make more of it? I'm like, that robot is not going to eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> so I mean, making more of it is not going to fix the problems. Your thoughts? Yeah, and it's, it's certainly understandable. And like I said, I mean, we have no precedent here. This is, you know, every system that has ever been designed in modern, you know, in modern times has been, you know, built under that underlying assumption. So getting away from that is going to be really hard. But we have got to be trying to get the industry's attention. And I think agriculture is going to uh, be among the first industries to see it. We see that a lot. Uh, you know, in, in China is a perfect example. Uh, labor costs in China have been rising dramatically, um, but we're seeing it even more so in rural China, right? Because of urbanization, that working age population and the people that move into the city aren't, you know, 70 year old people. These are the you know young people that are looking for jobs, right? And so that working age population um, is peaking right now in China. The, depending on who you talk to, it might have been a few years ago. It might be a few years from now, but it is in the process of peaking or has already peaked the working age population in China as a whole. But in rural China, it peaked in the early 90s. Yeah, that's the thing. Because because of the urbanization. We think that China is Shenzhen or Beijing, and there's a whole bunch of China that's not those places, and there's a different demographic completely. I mean, there's like it's like it's a it's a tale of two countries almost, is my understanding. And you've been there more. Real quickly, I want to, while we're talking about China, the whole article goes on to say that China's factories can plug a widening labor market gap and keep costs down with all this automation they're doing. And then it goes on to say. Many young, younger workers are shunning factory work for more flexible jobs in China's expanding services sector. And obviously, we can talk about tech. What's happening there is what happened here. And it's going to be, again, the automation. And then all of a sudden, the girl that doesn't go and work in the factory because she went to the city and she she doesn't have seven kids like her mom did. And this just becomes the perpetual cycle. We're going to be an aging and and a lesser population 20 years from now than we are right now. Um, And then the robots don't eat cheeseburgers. But we still think that there's going to be room to sell cheeseburgers. What else is uh, on the way out the door here? Because I know you got to go. Um, What else? What else should we expect? Um, I I think it's just these, these shifting patterns and trying to determine how do we manage a decline. I mean, we talked about on our business of ag success group uh, last week, we had an expert on water and he talked about, it really resonated with me because it talked about the Ogallala aquifer and how we need to, you know, manage that decline. So there's pretty much the assumption that it was going to decline, but how do we manage that, you know, to, to make that a soft landing? And I wait, think wait, that's wait. a concept we got to start. Assumption. You know what's neat to me? It was a resignation. It was an acceptance. It was beyond an assumption. It was like, uh, it's pretty much accepted that this is a declining situation. We're not there yet, Nag. Nobody other than you and I has accepted the idea that we're aging and shrinking in the next 10 to 20 to 30 years because they don't want to hear that. Will we do it? Will ag start to realize, oh, 
I guess we are kind of seeing it like when we hear it for the last 20 years, Hey, I'd bail small hay bales, but I can't get kids like you used to go out and bail small bales. Well, is that because there's no kids? Not really. There's kids, but there's a hell of a lot less of them than there were. I mean, we are seeing it and maybe we just haven't, we see it, but we don't, it's kind of like we see it, but we don't really understand it. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think we're, we're starting to see a, a growing acceptance, but we don't have a ton of time here. Um, we need to be preparing for this. And again, these are things that are going to happen over decades. But again, these are very entrenched systems and we don't have any answers at all. We need to start having these discussions. If we start having these discussions now, I think we can manage that decline in, in, in a graceful way. I think we can figure out ways to do that. Um, and, and certainly uh, agriculture is as innovative as any industry in the world. Um, and so I'm, I'm optimistic there. But the longer we wait, to, to start making those transitions, the more challenging that's going to be, the more impactful that it's going to be, and the more painful that it's going to be. And so that's why I'm trying to encourage people. Um, you know, 20 years may seem like a long time, but it's not. And a lot can change in 20 years. Like, again, like we said before, you know, 20 years ago, things were a lot different. It's not hard to, you know, go back 20 years and, and, and uh, not be able to imagine uh, the scenario that we're dealing with now. And, you know, I don't think the pace of change is slowing. You know, so, you know, if we're talking about going back and then looking forward 20 years, uh, the reality is that if we look forward 20 years from now, there's going to be even more change. And so it's not hard to imagine these scenarios that seem a little bit crazy. Um, they seem a lot more realistic when you think about them in that context. I, I guess on the way out the door, because we don't claim to have all the answers, but we absolutely are good at connecting the dots between the facts that we see, the trends that we are uh, observing and even feeling, and then making it the extrapolation of where that goes. It, it, dear listener, it's no doubt on the population decline, and, and you can disagree with that, but go back and listen to our other podcasts and the stuff with Daryl Bricker and Todd and I, but also the aging part. There's no denying it. The United States of America is 11 years older than it was 53 years ago on its median age, and that changes a lot of stuff. It changes a lot of stuff on the workforce and on consumption patterns. I guess I got one thought on the way out the door here. Talk about an ag industry that's had to adjust to a declining customer base. Tobacco. <laughs> Tobacco is the, is the one. And it wasn't easy, right? When I was born, talking about when people were younger, half the population smoked cigarettes when I was born. Now it's around less than 20% is the, is the number I read most recently. I think it's 17 or 19% of the population smokes. We've had to manage a declining consumer base. Imagine if we had to do that with corn, what we had to do with tobacco. Just a thought. Well, and I drove through uh, uh, Kentucky, uh, rural Kentucky, a couple of weeks ago. And a lot of that 20 years ago, even, uh, was still tobacco. Uh, the difference there is now it's corn and soybeans and, uh, you know, s some other stuff. But, you know, when that happened, everything else was still growing. Right. And so it was a matter of transitioning. Yeah. It wasn't a matter of of backing off. It wasn't a matter of putting that land, you know, the, that land became fallow or went into pasture or whatever. Right. Um, it's, it was a matter of transitioning. And this is more than just a transition. It's a it's a retraction. Yeah, that was a crop. That was one crop within an entire industry. That was an industry within the entire industry of agriculture. Now we're talking about the entire industry of agriculture faced with the idea of aging and or less customers as soon as 30 or so years from now. His name is Todd Thurman. He's got to go pick up his kids. My name is Damian Mason. He is my co-host and co-producer of the Business of Ag Success Group. If you're an ag professional and you want intelligent conversation and uh, dialogue like this with Outlook and special guest presenters, look me up. It's real easy. It's only nine nine dollars a month that's right 100 bucks a month and you're going to get great stuff like this plus you talk to other smart people that can probably help your career business of ag success group let me know if you want to be a member if you want to find todd how do they find you uh, uh, yeah you can find me on linkedin uh you can also go to uh swintex.com s-w-i-n-e-t-e-x.com and all my contact information is there by the way do follow him on linkedin he posts pretty pretty good stuff good commentary till next time i'm damian mason this is the business of agriculture Hey, thanks for being here. This episode of the Business of Agriculture was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You've heard me talk about Pattern Ag because I think it's a pretty cool concept. New technology that allows you to predict the problems you're going to have and therefore treat them before those problems cost you money. What kind of problems am I talking about? Pests 
and disease. Things like corn rootworm, uh, sudden death syndrome, cyst nematode, and a whole bunch of other bad things that happen out there in the field that can cost you money. Guess what? Pattern Ag will let you find out ahead of time if the disease or the pest pressure is there and therefore you're treating it before it costs you any money. What a great concept. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to learn more about their product, their technology, how it can make you money, save you yield, and all also where you can find a rep that can come out there and do the work for you. Pattern.ag. 